Amen. Amen. All right, focus. I want to focus there towards the beginning of the chapter, chapter number two, and we'll begin reading in. Uh, we'll just start reading. Might as well start reading in verse number four. KK, give me a water. Verse number four. It says, "These are the generations of the heavens and of the earth when they were created in the day that the Lord God made the earth and the heavens." And every plant of the field before it was in the earth, and every herb of the field before it grew. For the Lord God had not caused it to rain upon the earth, and there was not a man to till the ground. But there went up a mist from the earth and watered the whole face of the ground. And the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. And man became a living soul. And that's why I want to focus there in verse number 7. And I'm going to get the title of my sermon there from the end. The Bible says, And breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living soul. And the title of my sermon is The Breath of Life. Now here in regards to the creation account, when we're reading the story of creation, you know, he goes through and he creates specific things on certain days. And he works his way through. And it's real clear by the time you get to chapter number 2, when God creates man, that man is going to play a pivotal point for, for God. That man is basically the climax of the creation. That that is where God's focus and that is where God's attention is. When God creates the beast of the field, He just causes the beast of the field just to come up straight up out of the ground, basically. And then when He creates the sea of the, you know, the, the sea creatures, all the sea creatures, they just, the water just brings forth the sea creatures as well. And then the fowls of the air, the same thing. But when God creates man, God creates man and He forms man, right? God creates man in the formation of man. And he's lying there. And the Bible says specifically that God breathed the breath of life into Adam's nostrils. And man, and man became a living soul. And like I said, that's the title of my sermon, The Breath of Life. I'm going to preach about the breath of life. And I can see how a person could think, you know, you know, because I'm not only going to just preach on God's breath. We're going to look at a few verses here in just a minute where we're just going to look at just just when the God, when just mentions basically of God's breath just the, throughout the Bible because God's breath is mentioned many times. But I'm going to I'm going to preach specifically. I'm a, I'm going to home in on the subject of God's breath and how God's breath is able to give life. How God's breath is living. Now, turn in your Bibles to Job chapter number 4, verse number 9. I can understand how a person could think, how are you going to preach an entire sermon on the breath of life? Now, number one, the Bible is extremely deep, and it's extremely complex. And when you start studying the Bible, you just continually learn new things. And things that you thought were shallow, you know, you keep reading your Bible and you keep growing in the knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ and you start realizing that subjects that you thought were shallow aren't so shallow anymore. Amen. That the Bible's much deeper. Even things that, are, that would be considered the milk of the Word are very complex subjects. They can be, they, they have layers to them. The milk of the Word, obviously, it's something good for a new Christian to start learning and something good for a new Christian to start reading and different subjects and doctrines like that can be more simple, but they also have layers to them. And you can continually stu sub uh, study these subjects and you can continually grow and learn more things about these subjects. Now, that's point number one, that this is not just a simple subject. Point number two is that not only is this a deep subject, but there's something that's very much overlooked when the Bible talks about God's breath and how God gives life and how His breath contains life. So you're in Job chapter number 4. Look, in, uh, look at verse number 9. So we're just going to look at a few mentions of God's breath. That was the very first mention of God's breath that we read in Genesis chapter number 2. And we saw in Genesis chapter number 2 that God's breath played a very significant part in human history. Not just in human history, especially in the Bible, because God chooses what He's going to record from the beginning to put things in a certain light, to give us a certain knowledge or a certain understanding. And God makes sure that the very first mention of His breath, that He likens it, or He, he has it basically in the aspect of, his, of life, that, it, that it's able to give life. Look here at Job chapter number 4, look at verse number 9, God, a, a mention of God's breath. It says, by the blast of God they perish, and by the breath of his nostrils are they consumed. We're going to fly through these. Turn over, we'll stay in this book. Job chapter number 37. Job chapter number 37. Job chapter number 37, look down at verse number 10. The Bible says, by the breath of, of God frost is given, and by the breath of the waters 
is straightened. Turn to 2 Samuel chapter number 22. 2 Samuel chapter number 22. Look at 2 Samuel chapter number 22. Look at verse number 16. It says, And the channels of the sea appeared, the foundations of the world were discovered, at the rebuking of the Lord, at the, bl at the blast of the breath of His nostrils. Now turn over to Psalm chapter 18. Psalm chapter 18, verse number 15. So we're going to see this actually as, a, as another time that that same verse is quoted. Psalms chapter number 18, verse number 15. It says, Then the channels of waters were seen, and the foundations of the world were discovered at thy, at thy rebuke. O Lord, at the blast of the breath of thy nostrils. Last one, turn to Isaiah chapter number 30. Isaiah chapter number 30. Look at verse number 33. Isaiah chapter number 30, verse number 33. For Tophet is ordained of old, yea, for the king it is prepared. He hath made it deep and large. The pile thereof is fire and much wood. The breath of the Lord, like a stream of brimstone, doth kindle it. So one thing I want to point out to you is that notice that all, all these different mentions, that there's different functions that God's breath is playing. God is using His breath to perform all types of different tasks. You know, number one, we saw there in the very first verse in Job, actually in both of, of, of uh, the verses that we saw in Job, Job chapter number 4 and Job chapter number 37, God's breath was what was controlling the weather. Then we saw in 2 Samuel and in Psalms, how God's breath was able to just bring forth natural disasters. That His breath was how He was able to control, you know, uh, you know, basically nature. And He was able to just bring forth complete cataclysms just by His breath alone. Right here in Isaiah chapter number 30, if you're not familiar with this, Tophet is a figure of hell. So what this is saying is that God's breath is able to, you know, God's breath is what kindles the fire of hell. That's what this is saying. You know, some of this could be, you could maybe say, hey, maybe this is figurative in a sense. I personally don't believe that it is. I believe that all these mentions of God's breath are to express and to show the power that God's breath has. And not only that, we see in the very first mention of God's breath that it's considered the breath of life. That that's the title given to God's breath. When God breathes, that He is literally able. And if you try to wrap your mind around that, God Himself being an individual, being a separate being by Himself, nothing's living, nothing's alive, he is able to form man of the dust of the ground and he breathes the breath of life. And you know, it's not an extension of himself. He's able to create an independent being that has a sense of morality, that has its own conscience, that has a free will. I mean, it's just an amazing thought that God, you know, how God's breath is just able to bring forth life like that. So, one thing I want to point out here is that God's breath, number one, is powerful. Over and over, we see that God's breath has power. Number two, I want to point out is that when God wants to perform something, God will do it with His breath. When He has an act or a task that He needs to bring forth or that He needs to perform, God uses His breath. Now turn to Hebrews chapter number 11, verse number 3. So all throughout the Bible we see a theme of the power of God's breath. Another theme that we can see throughout the Bible is the power of God's Word. So look in Hebrews chapter number 11. Hebrews chapter number 11. Look at verse number 3. Hebrews chapter number 11, verse number 3. The Bible says, Through faith we understand that the worlds were framed by the Word of God. Talking about that's how the world was created. By the Word of God. So that things which are seen were not made of things which do appear. Turn to 2 Peter chapter number 3. 2 Peter chapter number 3. And we know that if we were to go back to the story of Genesis, just like this says, we know that the worlds were framed by the Word of God. When you look at the story of Genesis, the Bible says that God spake. It says that God said, let there be light, and there was light. So even just reading through the account, it's very clear what method God used to create the world. God used you know, His words. God used His voice. God's Word and God's voice is also very powerful. 2 Peter chapter number 3, look at verse number 5, we'll see this again. For this they willingly are ignorant of, talking about scoffers or mockers, people that deny you know, uh, God, people that deny Jesus. 
that by the word of God the heavens were of old and the earth standing out of the water and in the water. So there again, another reference that by the word of God the worlds were created. That that is the method that God chose to create the world. Turn to 1 Peter chapter number 1 verse number 23. 1 Peter chapter number 1 verse number 23, just one book over. This is going to be more of a Bible study this morning. Not as much preaching, more teaching. This is going to be a Bible study because this is a really deep subject. So we're going to be flipping back and forth you know, in our Bible. And I tried when I looked, because we're going to be going to so many scriptures. I tried to appropriate these, so I tried to put them close to one another, because there's so many scriptures that we're going to be looking at. So we saw there that God created the world by His Word. So there's different, there's different tasks that God will perform also with His Word. Look at 1 Peter chapter number 1, verse number 23. The Bible says, being born again, talking about being saved, being given eternal life, being born again, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible, <coughs> by the word of God, which liveth and abideth forever. For all flesh is as grass, and all the glory of man is the flower of grass. The grass withereth, and the flower thereof falleth away, but the word of the Lord endureth forever. And this is the word which by the gospel is preached unto you. Another verse, Romans chapter number 10, verse number 17 says this, So then faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. When a person gets saved, if a person is saved, the only way that they're saved is if they heard the word of God. You cannot be saved without God's word. In God's word is where the power is. I've heard a lot of people say, hey, well you can just hear the gospel. I can just tell you the gospel in my own words. Look at 1 Peter chapter number 1, verse number 25 again. It says, But the word of the Lord endureth forever. Now watch this. And this is the word which by the gospel is preached unto you. You cannot just go and just tell someone the gospel in your own words. Your words do not have power. God's word is what has power. God's word is what was able to create the heavens and the earth. God's word is what is able to give you life because God's words are what's living. Your words are not living. If you go and you quote God's words, then you are able to bring forth fruit. You are able to get people saved. But your words alone are not able to get people saved. Amen. If a person is saved, if they are born again, they are born again through the incorruptible Word of God. That is the only way that you can be saved. So you see that God has different methods also of His Word. We looked at His breath first. We have different methods also of His Word. One of the methods, one of the tasks that God performed with His Word was that that's how He created the worlds, the Bible said. Not only that, but right here we can see that the, that the way that a person gets saved is through God's Word. So when God has a task that He wants to perform, God will use His Word. Turn to James chapter number 1. James chapter number 1, verse number 18. James chapter number 1, verse number 18. <clears throat> we'll see this one more time. The Bible says in James chapter number 1, verse number 18. Of his own will begat he us with the word of truth that we should be a kind of first fruits of his creatures. So notice that again, talking about a begat thing. When you read about genealogy in the Bible, it'll often use that word begat. It just means that someone had a child. Someone brought forth a child. It's saying that someone's born, right? It's talking about being born again. So again, over and over again, this is not a doctrine that's up for discussion. People may reject this today, but people reject a lot of things that are clear in the Bible, like Jesus Christ's deity. This is a very clear doctrine. If someone has a testimony that they say, I've never heard the Word of God, but I know I'm going to heaven, and, and that's true, they never had heard the Word of God, then they're not going to heaven. You have to have the Bible to be saved. And you have to specifically have God's pure Word like we saw. And the end corruptible Word of God. And notice it compared the incorruptible Word of God, which was God's Word, to the corruptible Word, which was man's Word. And all of these other phony Bible versions are man's Word. They're not Amen. the same. That, there's a line drawn. They are not the same. Compare the Bibles. They're not the same. If a person gets saved, you get saved by reading, by, by someone preaching unto you from a King James Bible. Not just any Bible. Amen. From a King James Bible. Now, if there are certain verses that are the same, in the King James Bible, which would also be the same as you know the Texas Receptus and the original manuscripts, well, then I believe that person could get saved if it's in one of those other versions. But if it is not the same, then it does not have God's power in it. It does not contain God's power. Now turn to John chapter number 6, verse number 63, and we'll see why. John. <clears throat> 
John chapter number 6, verse number 63, this is Jesus speaking. John chapter number 6, verse number 63, Jesus said, It is the Spirit that quickeneth, the flesh profiteth nothing. Now watch what he says. The words that I speak unto you, they are spirit and they are life. And it's pretty simple to conclude that. If you think, hey, if Jesus Christ walking upon this earth was able to give life through his words, obviously his words aren't normal. He would have to have, his words would literally have to be living. This is why something dead cannot produce something living. You, some, only something living, it seems simple, but only something living can, can produce something else that's alive. Therefore, when Jesus Christ was walking upon this earth, and He's offering people everlasting life, eternal life, the simple thing to conclude is that His words must contain life. His words are not normal. His words are not like our words. The reason why the, you have to have the Bible to be saved, there's a reason behind it. Everything makes sense in the Bible. You know, people think, people just, uh, people attack these doctrines. They, you know, they think that you just make stuff up like this. No, the Bible has reasons behind it. It's because God's Word is, is alive. God's Word is living and it has power. And when you preach to someone, the reason why you have to have God's Word, the reason why a person cannot be saved without God's Word is because God's words contain life. Your words do not contain life. And they'll just kind of look at you like you're stupid. Why? Well, I just can't give the gospel to somebody. No! You do not have living words. Your words are not alive. Jesus said, the words that I speak unto you, they are spirit and they are life. And that's another thing I want to point out real quick before we move on to our next verse. The word spirit and the word life are used synonymous all throughout the Bible. The word spirit means the same thing as life. Turn in your Bibles to John chapter number 5, verse number 25. There's tons of other examples that talk about how you have to have God's Word. You know, another one that I quote when I go out soul winning all the time, you know, I don't point out the fact of how you have to have God's Word, but I quote this, you know, to, to explain that you're passed from death unto life is in John chapter 5 where Jesus says, Verily, verily, I say unto you, He that heareth my word and believeth on him that sent me. There's examples, subtle examples like that all the time. So you have to hear. One of the requirements to be saved is, number one, you have to be hearing God's Word. You have to put your faith into God's Word. So look there in, in John chapter number 5, verse number 25. The Bible says, Verily, verily, I say unto you, the hour is coming and now is when the dead shall hear the voice of the Son of God and they that hear it shall live. This is actually the verse af right after what I just quoted. Now right here he's talking about spiritual salvation. He's talking about like we saw a minute ago, being born again. The Bible describes people that are unsaved as being dead. It talks about, you know, Jesus is going to judge one day the quick and the dead. It talks about, you know, how we are dead and your trespasses and your sins. The verse right before that is a good example too. It says, he that heareth my word and believeth on him that sent me hath present tense everlasting life and shall not come future tense into condemnation. Now watch this. But is passed from death unto life. That implies that you're dead right now. That implies that right now you're dead and you've been passed from death unto life. That's because your soul is dead. And when God, when, you, when you're given eternal life, when you're given everlasting life, it's a spiritual everlasting life. It's a spirit, it's given to your soul. This body, this flesh is still going to die one day. My soul is going to go to heaven. But there will be a point in the future, you know, when my, when my body is resurrected as well. That's the next verse we're going to look at. Look down at verse number 28. So verse number 25, keep in mind, that was talking about a spiritual life that is given to you. That's talking about someone giving, being given everlasting life. Look at verse number 20, 28. <clears throat> he says this, Marvel not at this, for the hour is coming in the which all that are in the graves shall hear his voice. And shall come forth they that have done good unto the resurrection of life, and they that have done evil unto the resurrection of damnation. So not only does God's word have the power to create all the hosts of all the world, the heavens and the earth, and not only does God's power, God's word have the power to, cre to cre create in you a new creature, to create in you, you know, give you everlasting life and to cause you to be able to be born again. But God's word is also the, the, the method that will be used 
When God wants to perform a task as far as even bringing forth the resurrection. When God wants to physically raise someone from the dead in the end times, God is going to use the power of His Word. So not only is God's Word used when you're saved spiritually, God's Word will also be used in the end times. At the time when the physical or bodily resurrection takes place. Turn to John chapter 11 verse 41 and we'll see Jesus do this even while He was on this earth. <clears throat> so in the beginning we looked at the power of God's breath and how God would use God, and God would use His breath to perform a task that He, want, that he needed to be done. <clears throat> now we're looking at the power of God's Word. And how God uses His Word to perform a task when it needs to be complete or something needs to be accomplished. Like I said, I tried to keep all these close to each other. That's why we're looking at all the verses in John right now. So look at John chapter number 11, verse number 41. John chapter number 11, verse number 41. The Bible says, this is with Lazarus. Then they took away the stone from the place where the dead was laid. And Jesus lifted up his eyes and said, Father, I thank thee that thou hast heard me. And I knew that thou hearest me always, but because of the people which stand by, I said it, that they may believe that thou hast sent me. Verse 43, and when he, had thus, when he thus had spoken, he cried with a loud voice. So he's speaking, this is his words. He cried with a loud voice, Lazarus, Lazarus, come forth. And he that was dead came forth bound hand and foot with grave clothes, and his face was bound about with a napkin. Jesus saith unto them, Loose him and let him go. So we see an example of this even while Jesus was walking upon this earth. So when Jesus says, The words that I speak unto you, they are spirit and they are life. He's not only saying that He can give you spiritual salvation. He's not only saying that He can give you eternal life or everlasting life through His words. He's saying that His words are capable of giving you physical life as well. He was, he was able with Lazarus to be dead for four days to go before the tomb. They moved, you know, they, they ended up moving the stone away. And He just says, Lazarus, come, Lazarus, come forth with His words alone, with the power of God's Word. He's able to bring forth spiritual life. He's able to bring forth physical life. And He's able to create all the heavens and all the earth, all the host of them. Turn to John chapter number 20. John chapter number 20. John chapter number 20. Look at verse number 19. So this is an extremely significant moment right here. This is actually when, and I'll explain this a little deeper in a minute. This is actually when God gives the eternal life. Now let me say this. If a person believes on Jesus Christ, at that moment, they are accounted eternal life. But there was a time when God actually gave you know, eternal life or everlasting life to mankind. Look at John chapter number 20, verse number 19. Then the same day at evening, being the first day of the week when the doors were shut, where the disciples were assembled for fear of the Jews, came Jesus and stood in the midst of them, stood in the midst, and saith unto them, Peace be unto you. And when he had so said, he showed unto them his hands and his side. Then were the disciples glad when they saw the Lord. Then said Jesus to them again, Peace be unto you, as my Father hath sent me, even so send I you. Now verse 22 I want to focus on. And when he had said this, he breathed on them, and saith unto them, Receive ye... Excuse me. Receive ye the Holy Ghost. Now the Holy Ghost, the Holy Spirit that you are given when you believe on Jesus Christ is eternal life. That is your eternal life that you have dwelling inside of you. Now a lot of people just overlook that. I'm going to show you a passage here in a minute, minute that just point blank says that the Holy Spirit is your everlasting life or is your eternal life. Now don't misunderstand this. Salvation has always been the same. Salvation has always been by grace through faith. But the Bible very clearly says, and that's why the Bible says that God accounted it unto Abraham for righteousness. He still, you know, a Abraham, as far as the record goes, went, still had eternal life, and he still had righteousness. 
But he hadn't received the down payment like we have today. That's why we're held to a higher standard in, in the New Testament. Amen. You have the Holy Spirit living inside of you, so you're able to understand more than they were of the Old Testament. Plus, you have the entire Bible at your exposure, constantly to read, easy to access. We are held to a higher standard because of that. And we also, our righteousness is actually given to us from the Holy Spirit. That is the righteousness that we possess because God is righteous. The reason why the Holy Spirit is eternal life is because it's God. God is eternal. The word spirit, like I said, just means life. In Romans chapter number 8, it says the spirit is life because of righteousness. Talking about God's spirit. Now, look over. I wasn't going to have you turn here, but just to make it easier, we keep your hand here. Look over at John chapter number 7. John chapter number 7. But keep your hand in John chapter number 20. Just to make sure that, uh, that everybody clearly understands. They know I'm not just blowing smoke. The Bible clearly states that the Holy Spirit is your eternal life. It says in verse number 38, Jesus speaking, He that believeth on me, as the Scripture hath said, out of his belly shall flow rivers of living water. Now watch verse number 39. But this spake he of the Spirit, which they that believe on him should receive, for the Holy Ghost was not yet given, because that, because that Jesus was not yet glorified. Now go back to John chapter number 20. So he clearly says that the living waters are the Holy Ghost. Now a person could say, well, how do you know the living waters are, are uh, everlasting life? Jesus said in John chapter 4, when he was speaking unto the Samaritan woman, unto the woman at the well, he said, but whosoever drinketh of the water that I shall give him shall never thirst. The water that I shall give him shall be in him a well of water springing up into everlasting life. Amen. This Holy Spirit that you possess is literally the everlasting life or the eternal life that you have been given. That is the down payment. Now, like I said, don't misunderstand this. This is the time that Jesus Christ gave you know, eternal life or gave everlasting life through the Holy Spirit. But the people in the Old Testament, they still had eternal life and everlasting life. They still had you know, assurance of salvation and eternal security. But on the record, they, God accounted it unto them. They could never lose that. Once they believed on Christ, they were going to heaven. But they didn't receive the benefit of actually having that while on this earth. They didn't receive the benefit of actually possessing you know, the Holy Spirit and the eternal life inside themselves. When they died, they were going to heaven no matter what. Now, that's why I believe. So don't misunderstand me. Very clear. Now, when you look here in John chapter number 20, verse number 22, one thing that people often, often misunderstand, and something that I've heard mispreached many times, is actually how this, how, this was, how this took place practically. Look at verse number 22 when Jesus is speaking. It says, And when he had said this, referring to the verse number 21, the last statement he made, Peace be unto you, as my Father hath sent me, even so send I you. And then it says in verse number 22, And when he had said this, the statement we just read, He breathed on them, and saith unto them, Receive ye the Holy Ghost. So a lot of people will preach that Jesus just, just breathed on them, just looked at them and was just like... <gasps> That's not what he did. The Bible is really clear. It says that, and when he had said this, he breathed on them and saith unto them. So at the same time that he's breathing, he's speaking unto them. Yeah. And this may come as a scientific you know, discovery to you, but while you speak, you are breathing. Breath is coming out. That is able. That's how you're able to make noise. Just how you know a trumpet works. It's the same exact way. When you blow air through there, through your vocal cords, that's a, that's how you are capable of making noise because your breath is is coming out. You are breathing out. So Jesus Christ, when He gave life here, when He gave eternal life, when He gave everlasting life, when He gave the Holy Spirit, God, Jesus, while on this earth spoke, and he also breathed the breath of life. Amen. He was breathing. Now turn to Ezekiel chapter number 37. We'll see this again. We'll see where, where God's breath is likened unto his word. They're both parallel with one another. They're both taking place concurrently. And that's what was going on there. He was breathing and he was speaking simultaneously, concurrently, both at the exact same time. <clears throat> Look at Ezekiel chapter number 37. <clears throat> Ezekiel chapter number 37.
We'll start reading in verse number 1. <clears throat> the Bible says in Ezekiel chapter number 37, verse number 1, The hand of the Lord was upon me, this is Ezekiel speaking, and carried me out of the Spirit of the Lord, and set me down in the midst of the valley which was full of bones, and caused me to pass by them round about. And behold, there were very many in the open valley, and lo, they were very dry. And he said unto me, Son of man, can these bones live? <clears throat> and I answered, O Lord God, thou knowest. Again he said unto me, Prophesy upon these bones and say unto them, O ye dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. So what's going to give them life? The word of the Lord. Keep reading verse number 5. Thus saith the Lord God unto these bones, Behold, now watch this, I will cause breath to enter into you, and ye shall live. So notice, breath and life are simultaneous there. And I will lay sinews upon you, and will bring up flesh upon you, and cover you with skin, and put breath in you, and ye shall live. And ye shall know that I am the Lord. Verse 7, now watch this again. So I prophesied as I was commanded, and as I prophesied there was a noise, and behold, a shaking, and the bones came together, bone to his bone. And when I had beheld, lo, the sinews and the flesh came up upon them, and the skin covered them above, but there was no breath in them. So he's saying they're not alive yet. Just like in Genesis chapter number 2, they're not alive yet. Then said he unto me, prophesy unto the wind, prophesy, son of man, and say to the wind, thus saith the Lord God, come from the four winds, O breath, and breathe upon these slain, that they may live. So I prophesied as he commanded me, and the breath came into them, and they lived, and stood up upon their feet, an exceeding great army. So notice the two things that are seen again. We see the power of God's breath, how God's breath is able to give life here. And then we also see that Ezekiel is prophesying. Many people misunderstand what prophesy means. Prophesy does not necessarily mean to just foretell the future or to make some sort of revelation of something that's going to happen in the end time. The word prophesy just means to preach. All it means is that God's word is coming out of your mouth. So we see the two things again. We see the power of God's word, that God's word is what was able to bring forth life here. Number one, we see that also God's breath was what was needed to bring forth life. The same thing that we saw in John chapter number 20. At the same time, simultaneously, while God, while Jesus Christ was breathing, while He was speaking, was when He was able to, give for, bring, to bring forth life. He was able to give everlasting life or eternal life. Now turn to Psalms chapter number 33, verse number 6. Psalms chapter number 33, verse number 6. <clears throat> Psalms chapter number 33, verse number 6. <clears throat> the Bible's real clear that God created everything through His Word. Everything. Over and over again, there's tons of verses that say that God created everything. Not just part of it, not just some things. Everything through His Word. One of them, as an example, is John chapter number 1, verse number 1. Real famous, we use this to prove the deity of Christ. It says in verse number 1, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. Then the, the very next verse, verse number 3, says this, All things were made by Him, talking about the Word. And now watch this, And without Him was not anything made that was made. That's also a good verse to bring up to Jehovah's Witnesses, because they say that Jesus Christ, specifically if you take him to John chapter 1, They'll try to say, you know, well, Jesus Christ is a created God. Well, how is that possible if it says all things were made by Him, and without Him was not anything made that was made? How would He be created then? If every single thing that's upon this planet, every single thing that's living and breathing, was brought forth by His Word. It's impossible. You know, everything upon this planet was created by God's breath and by God's Word. Look at Psalms chapter number 33, verse number 6. And this verse right here just ties it all together. Psalms chapter number 33, verse number 6, the Bible says, By the word of the Lord were the heavens made, and all, watch this, and all the host of them by the breath of His mouth. So every time when you see the Bible talking about the power of God's breath, 
Do you know what it's really talking about? It's talking about the power of God's word. Right here, breath and mouth are used synonymous. Or breath and word, I'm sorry, breath and word are used synonymous. Look at verse number 6 one more time. He's just restating the same thing twice. He says, By the word of the Lord the heavens were made, and all the host of them by the breath of His mouth. So when the Bible talks about the power of God's breath, it's talking about the power of God's word. Turn to 1 John chapter number 1. So when God breathed the breath of life into Adam's nostrils, God was speaking while He did it. God was talking just like when God gave everlasting life. The Bible doesn't record what He said. But just like when God gave everlasting life, when Jesus was upon this earth, God in the flesh, unto the disciples, He spoke while He breathed. Now, the, the, the complete proof of that, where the Bible actually says that, it did, that it, that's how it took place, is Zechariah chapter number 12, verse number 1. The Bible says this, The burden of the word of the Lord for Israel, saith the Lord. So the subject is the word of the Lord, which stretcheth forth the heavens, and layeth the foundation of the earth, and formeth the spirit of man within him. Very clearly, the Bible says that not only did God breathe the breath of life into Adam's nostrils, but God spoke while he did so. Just like in, in John chapter 20, when God gave everlasting life or eternal life. So look at 1 John chapter number 1. 1 John chapter number 1. Verse number 1. The Bible says, That which was from the beginning, <clears throat> which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked upon and our hands have handled of the word of life. Like I said, at the same time in the Garden of Eden, in the beginning, just like it said in John chapter number 1, in the beginning was the word. Well, you know, Genesis chapter number 1 starts out in the beginning. In Genesis chapter number 2, in the beginning, when God spoke, when God breathed the breath of life in Adam's nostrils, do you know what he was, it was? It was the word of life. The breath of life and the word of life are synonymous. Now, I showed you quite a few examples, but there is many more if you wanted to do your own personal study on this, where the Bible talks about over and over again about the breath of God, you know, uh, being what gives spirit, gives the spirit unto man. But then there's also a, a lot of other verses that talk about that the word of life is what gave the spirit unto man. Now, what we can take away from this. It's like in 2 Timothy chapter number 3, verse number 16, the Bible says that all Scripture, talking about the Bible, all, all, all Scripture is given by inspiration of God. And what the word inspiration means, it's like the word, you know, people have kind of corrupted that word today to kind of make it mean like motivating or like encouraging, like that's real inspiring. But that's not what the word means. It has the same root word as like, you know, people know like what a respirator is or what respire, respiration. It's talking about the spire there. They share a root word. It's talking about breathing. Re would just mean to do again, the prefix. Spire, respiration is the root word and it means to breathe. It comes from like the word spirit. It means to breathe, inspiration. What that word inspiration literally means is it means God breathed. When it says all scripture was given by inspiration of God. It's talking about the scriptures. It's talking about the Bible. It's talking about the Bible actually that God spoke these words or God breathed these words. The breath of life or the word of life. So what we can take away from this as a Christian is that when we have a King James Bible in our hand and we're holding this Bible in our hand, you know, you're not just holding any normal book. Jesus said, the words that I speak unto you, they are spirit and they are life. You are literally, when you have a King James Bible in your hand, you are literally carrying around the breath of life. You are carrying around the words of life. I mean, that's powerful. What other book, what, what other things on this planet exist that you can say something like, like that about? So when you go out and you're preaching the gospel and you're preaching, you know, God's word to people, you know, understand what power that you have in your hand. Understand that it's not just your words. Your words, the flesh profiteth nothing. Your words, if you're going to get someone saved, it's going to be with the breath of life. It's going to be with the word of life by preaching the Bible unto somebody. And not only that, if you're not reading your Bible much, this should push you to want to read your Bible more. To understand that same breath 
that was breathed into Adam's nostrils, that was able to bring forth life, that was able to give you know, a, you know, just a dead body of cells with nothing going on there, nothing active, the brain's not functional, and God just breathes His breath into that. He speaks His words into that body. The same breath and the same words that when Jesus was upon this earth was able to give forth the Holy Ghost, eternal life, everlasting life, while He walked upon this planet, that should push you to want to read your Bible more. That should push you to, to, you know, to love your Bible and to want to study your Bible more when you understand that you have the breath of life in your hands, that you have the Word of life in your hands. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, God, we, we thank You for this day, dear Lord. We thank You for something so precious that You've given us, dear Lord. Help us to understand what we have, dear Lord. Help us to, to, to value it very highly in our minds, dear Lord God, and to treat it that way and to study it and to love it. Dear God, we ask you that you would just bless the rest of the day today, dear Lord. Bless all the services uh, to follow. And in Jesus Christ's name, amen. Amen. amen.